and then I request uh, yeah, our colleagues to please start the webinar with a quick introduction of our director who will welcome the gathering for today's e-dialogue. Good morning to one and all. I'm Kiran Mai, Project Nutrition Scientist B in LFOF initiative supported by UNICEF. Greetings to each one of you present here. I'm extremely overwhelmed to welcome everyone to this amazing sixth e-dialogue series of Let's Fix Our Food on priorities in nutrition education to school age children. It's my pleasure to introduce our dynamic director of our premierly reputed institute, National Institute of Nutrition, Dr. Hemalata Ma'am. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, one Can minute. you hear me? Yeah, one minute, ma'am. We are sharing the screen once. Or I'm going to share the screen. Yeah. Yes. Hello? Yeah. Can I? Yeah. Ma'am, one minute. Yeah. Can you hear me? Ma'am, just a second. Madam has worked extensively on nutrition and immunity, maternal and child nutrition. So she crazy. has led seminal work on RDAs and EARs for Indians. Madam has developed my plate for the day and recommendations for balanced diet to different age and physiological groups. She has authored more than 200 peer reviewed scientific papers, book chapters and regulatory reports. Thank you, ma'am. I'm over to you for the well. Yeah. Am I audible? Subara? Yes. Yes, uh, ma'am. Yes, yes. A very warm welcome to the uh, sixth e dialogue series, uh, uh, which is on priorities in nutrition education for school age children. A very, very warm welcome to all the esteemed speakers and renowned uh, panelists uh, for sparing their valuable time. Uh, and also, I congratulate uh, Dr. Subara and his team for making this possible, which is a very, very important uh, agenda. Um, so here I would like to tell a few remarks about the adolescents uh, health status in the country today and their knowledge just in two, three minutes. Uh, all of us know very well that, uh, I mean, a third of our adolescents are, uh, I mean, majority of our adolescents are suffering from either spectrum of uh, nutrition disorders like uh, stunting and thinness and also uh, anemia. And on the other side, we also have overweight obesity. And uh, ironically, half of this population which seem to be undernourished also have a few biomarkers which are disrupted, showing that they have higher risk of developing diet-related non-communicable diseases at, at adult age. So this is the current situation in India. A significant proportion of adolescents consume, not significant proportion, I would say a majority of them consume nutritionally inadequate diets that are rich in fats and sugar and salt and very poor in nutrition. And this is, I mean, all, all of us know this is because of easy availability and affordability of uh, high fat salt sugar foods but it also due to the thought that it is hip to hold a, a coke in hand rather than a buttermilk which is a traditional nutritionally rich food and it is also thought to be very fashionable to hold a donut or a pack of uh, french fries uh, rather than a boiled chickpea or boiled lobia which we used to consume as children as adolescents which used to be so uh, i mean which used to be uh, available in those days, but now it is not uh, in fashion and uh, the, Gen, the, the Gen Z considers it to be very old fashioned. Then um, um, consumption of traditional food has become a thing of past, consumption of fruits and vegetables also is very low. There is hard data to show all these things. And in ancient India, science of food, nutrition and health was always emphasized well how food influences every aspect of a life, physical, mental well-being, and also behavior. We know very well how, I mean, food is classified like rajasic, tamasic, satric also. And even Ayurveda has large sections of chapters dedicated to food and well-being. Uh, whereas globally, the modern world uh, thought that it is important to have nutrition education only in the 1950s, that to after protein energy malnutrition like marasmus and koshiyakar was very rampant and they knew that it is because of faulty uh, weaning uh, uh, faulty breastfeeding practices and weaning practices only then the emphasis came uh, uh, on nutrition education that too not in a structured way it is a very superficial uh, way of education uh, so we have our teenagers a majority section of teenagers with increased prevalence of an array of nutrition-related conditions uh, with no skills to combat 
this nutrition disorders. Even now, the attempt on education is very superficial. We always think of app or web-based technologies or social media. But what we require, I feel very strongly, is a structured education system, which will cover nutrition, physical activity, and well-being. Because it's not just nutrition. Physical activity is also extremely poor with these teenagers. So we should have dedicated chapters right from class one as in a structured manner. We have to educate our uh, teenagers and children on nutrition, well-being, and physical activity. So with these few remarks, I hand over uh, to Dr. Subara and congratulate him and my best wishes to the team. Thank you, Subara. Ma'am, thank you very much for those very uh, important and enlightening opening remarks. And as you rightly said, uh, the structuring of the nutrition education as an important part of the school curriculum is very important alongside other measures which can only complement this core education that happens. And uh, all through this LFOF, we've been also talking in terms of uh, uh, making it a skill-based education. And thank you very much for those remarks. Uh, now, uh, without much ado, I'll go in for a quick introduction of uh, LFOF uh, without any formal presentation. And I should really thank uh, Dr. Hemlata ma'am for taking time out despite her very busy schedule. Am I audible? Yes, yes. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Now I'll quickly um, uh, uh, do a brief intro of uh, the initiative for all those uh, who do not know uh, about LFOF. And uh, with, is my screen visible? Not yet. I hope it's now. Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, the entire Let's Fix Our Food initiative uh, is actually now a big consortium, which is uh, speaking in terms of one voice in trying to bring the young people and adolescents uh, right uh, to define their own uh, health system and food systems and also the food environment. In this, we have several collaborators. And this all started from a meeting with the Niti Aayog, which is a uh, you know premier policy making body in India, which coordinates with several ministries, wherein five key actions in the context of growing overweight and obesity among adolescents, five key actions especially were identified. Uh, they are regulating private and public media advertising for HFSS foods at high fat, sugar, and salt foods, and nutrition literacy approach uh, led by adolescents, uh, which is which is a key component. And today's uh, uh, webinar also falls in this particular uh, priority area. And then we also have front of pack nutrition labeling where India is still uh, contemplating and going uh, uh, you know, a few steps forward and one step backward in terms of uh, uh, FOPNL, but we are getting there very soon. And once the front of pack nutrition labeling is introduced in Indian context, again, adolescents have, uh, uh, have to have this as part of essential nutrition education and literacy component so that they make this information uh, make uh, uh, this information useful for themselves and they make uh, informed food choices and then there is there are there was a discussion about taxing hfss foods as just this morning dr preetu had shared uh, an information from the world bank which says 50% of the countries in the world have taxes on sugar sweetened beverages uh, i don't know whether we are uh, still there or not but you know there is a scope for taking this as an initiative, but it's a long drawn initiative uh, for which the consortium will work together. And there are double duty actions. And uh, in all the conversations that are related to forming or dis defining the environment of the food environment of the adolescents and children, the children and adolescents are themselves often missed out. This is an endeavor to bring them together. And in this, we have several partners uh, who uh, uh, together are working on policy actions, adolescent engagement and capacity building. Uh, policy actions emanate from uh, e-dialogues, which, which are, uh, you know, like this uh, multi-stakeholder group meetings where these five issues are discussed and then policy briefs are brought out of them. And similarly, uh, the current policy environment is being reviewed, analyzed, and then brought out in terms of policy uh, uh, briefs by Public Health Foundation of India, which is a key partner in uh, academic collaboration with all of us. 
And then there is a capacity building of adolescent dancers, which is also partially led by uh, us along with PHFI, wherein we trained a group of uh, adolescent youth leaders who uh, invariably are part of this e webinars and also uh, they themselves are uh, inter uh, gathering many more uh, of their ilk to actually come together in this particular endeavor. And uh, these are the uh, uh, partners, some of them, and then we have many more. The result, result to Solve has joined us recently and Public Health, uh, I mean, the uh, IFPRI has joined recently and uh, many more uh, uh, global bodies are part of this initiative. And some of us are enabling partners for some of the initiatives, some of us are implementing partners, while the others act as knowledge partners in the entire uh, uh, LFOF uh, uh, consortium activity. And coming to nutrition literacy, as we know, nutrition literacy, I'm looking forward to hear from uh, the global review as well as the experiments that have been done in Malaysia and from our uh, elite uh, panelists who will share uh, their ex experiences in other uh, sectors and how we can uh, learn lessons for nutrition literacy among adolescents. But it is di distinct and it is a, although it is a part of health literacy, it is distinct in uh, itself and nutrition literacy is not just the knowledge, but also the ability to use that knowledge and put that uh, information to use in uh, food choices uh, in day-to-day -day life. And then we see a child's consumption environment is shaped largely by all this, understanding perception, the environment around the skills that the child has, peers, parents, teacher, and the immediate environment, the education and curriculum. Today, we uh, concentrate on these two. And then we, as NIN, we have done some studies on the school comp, uh, nutrition uh, and food safety component in school science curricula way back in 2012. And after that, we are trying to update our information on the textbooks analysis, content analysis of textbooks, which will be presented by uh, our colleague, uh, Dr. Radhika from Symbiosis. And we also have many more uh, lessons to learn from other um, uh, others, from other scholars from other parts of the world. And with these few words, I have, although I have a couple of slides to share, in the interest of time, I'll just stop here. And then I hope this has built a kind of um, uh, background for today's uh, uh, e-dialogue. And may I now request my uh, colleague to introduce our next speaker. Thank you, sir, for your valuable views. I feel delighted to welcome our next speaker, Dr. Maha. She's the coordinator, Food Science Unit, National Council for Scientific Research, Lebanon. Professor Maha holds a PhD in Nutritional Sciences. She's the founder of the Public Health Nutrition Program of Lebanon, the Lebanese University Nutrition Surveillance Center. She chairs the scientific committee at the Lebanese Order of Dietitians and is a scientific member of the Food Safety Task Force at the Lebanese Ministry of Public Health. She has more than 50 publications, mainly on non-communicable diseases, fruits and vegetables intake, Mediterranean diet, smoking and body weight, physical activity and body markers, autism and nutrition, body image and healthy lifestyle. I request Dr. Maha to share her valuable views on the topic, global, perspec global perspective on food and nutrition literacy among adolescents. Over to you, ma'am. Good morning. Thank you so much for, uh, for this beautiful uh, uh, consortium and uh, very important one. Uh, I don't know if you are seeing my, uh, my video. Uh, I, uh, first of all, I would like to share my screen, please, if you can. Uh, give me a remote access, please. Yeah, Paramita, uh, stop sharing your screen and then provide. Sir, I have stopped it. You have to leave the yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the slides are, are here. Yes, yes. Uh, I think you should uh, put them in slideshow mode. Yes. 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 Uh, thank you. First of all, uh, we know very well that food is necessity for every human being, which makes the topic of food and nutrition relevant in everyone's life. 
So food is also one of the topics addressed in the Agenda 2030, more commonly called the United Nations Sustainable Developmental Goals or the SDGs. Among the SDGs, SDG 2 works toward eliminating hunger, providing access to food for everyone and creating sustainable food production system. Beyond SDG 2 and SDG 4, uh, well, we have uh, beyond SDG 2, we have the SDG 4 that works on quality education, which considers the importance of developing global citizens who can find innovative solution for the future. We know very well that SDG 4.7, which is the transformative education, must be integrated into educational settings to encourage students to critically reflect on their assumption and beliefs. So uh, in addition to the SDG 4.7, we have the SDG 4, which, uh, in which the target 4A highlights the importance of creating safe, inclusive, and non-discriminatory learning environment for all students. Um, I'm sorry, I don't know if you are seeing my video uh, or um, my, uh, my image or my photo. No, no, we are not able to see you. We just see a, uh, you know, background, a virtual background of yours without you in the um, foreground. Um, you can disable the background otherwise and then. Okay, L let me remove it. Okay. But still, we can't see you. Um, okay. I don't know what is the problem. Uh, we can see your slides, though, but we can't see you. That's okay. Otherwise, we can see the screen, so we can go ahead with this. Yeah, session. we can. We can see the. We are, we are able to see the slides, uh, Dr. Maha. Can you continue your presentation, okay. and then we'll fix okay. it later. Yeah. Okay. Uh, um, just a minute. So. Okay. So. Uh, Okay, so uh, concerning the concept of education for sustainable food and nutrition, and based on the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Reports on Global Warming, in addition to the recommendation raised by the EAT Lancet Commission on Food, Planet Health Recommendations for Sustainable Diet, and the Lancet Commission on Obesity, uh, which recommend uh, a new term called the global pandemic, the concept of sustainable nutrition uh, and uh, uh, food literacy was created. So we know very well that food and nutrition literacy are specific forms of the broader concept of what we call the health literacy. As for, uh, or according to the definition of Truman et al, food literacy is a foundation of knowledge, understanding and awareness that allows people to perform actions related to food and think critically about their relationship to the broader food system. Also, the nutrition literacy is the degree to which people have the ability to one, obtain, two, process, three, understand the basic diet info and the tools needed to make appropriate nutrition decision. So although knowledge regarding healthy eating behavior is necessary, the extensive research on behavior change suggests that uh, knowledge on its own is often not sufficient to change individual behavior, including food choices. So this highlights the need to move beyond knowledge, to be more inclusive uh, and to add inclusive concepts such as literacy to effect change in behaviors of interest, including the type of diet. As such, 
the concept of food literacy offers kind of integrative framework for investigating and understanding the factors that shape food intake and also dietary pattern at individual le level and after that uh, uh, in the community. According to a systematic review, uh, it's old, but it's very important. Uh, they said that food literacy may influence adolescent dietary intake. And they said that it's apparent that there is lack of research that has measured all aspects of food literacy over time, or even longitudinally to determine the strengths and nature of the association between food and the nutrition literacy and the dietary intake. So the review identified the need for uh, a rigorous research method to attain greater understanding on how the knowledge and the literacy with regards to diet and food will affect the dietary intake. This systematic review suggested in 2013 that we need to improve food literacy in, uh, mainly in adolescents. Why? To improve individual uh, food skills and healthier dietary behaviors where at households and among parents and also among adolescents. So the evidence recommends public health promotion practitioners and policy ma makers to consider new public health strategies that focus on increasing food literacy, especially among adolescents. Another one published in 2022 showed that the successful intervention strategies when we apply food and nutrition literacy led to improvement in one, functional, two, partly interactive, and three, the critical skills. So the concept of food and nutrition literacy along with the, uh, the implementation of this concept and the intervention will uh, help the adolescent to shape their interactive critical skills and have a good dietary intake. We want to share with you today our experience in the Arab world, mainly in the Eastern Mediterranean region, uh, concerning the food and the nutrition literacy. We started our uh, project that was supported by the ESQA. Uh, it's one of the UN agencies, and uh, it was presented uh, in uh, one of the uh, meeting of ESQA. Uh, we started by doing a kind of situational analysis for our situation in the Eastern Mediterranean region, where we have more than 69 million people are in the situation of hunger, 141 million people are food insecure, and uh, around uh, 75, 69 to 75 million people will be undernourished in 2030. So uh, in addition to this, we uh, uh, have also kind of overnutrition, which is in the uh, 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 third most ob obese. Uh, we have the rank of the third most obese uh, in the world concerning uh, uh, the, the population. So uh, we did uh, uh, this uh, project because we saw these numbers. And we thought that while there is extensive research on education, for sustainable development, we have limited research in the Arab world and the Eastern Mediterranean area that has been conducted uh, with regards to the education for sustainable food and nutrition. So here we have two terms, the education and the sustainable food and nutrition. So at the moment, we don't have any practical information to start what we call the sustainable food and nutrition habits at school in the Eastern Mediterranean region. And the educational guideline for school that want to transform toward incorporating more sustainable food and nutrition in our Arab schools is needed to support the change implemented or requested by the uh, sustainable developmental goals. We did, we published this study uh, in 2022, which shows the lack of the concept of nutrition and food literacy in the MENA region. And it was the first publication that shows this 
a gap. Uh, uh, first, we know very well that food and nutrition literacy are fundamental uh, in promoting better diet, uh, affect behavior change, food label use, the dietary diversity, the food security, the lower risk of overweight and obesity, and also the food and nutrition literacy, according to our review paper, showed according to many studies that it lower vulnerability to developing nutrition-related non-communicable disease, and it improves school performance and make better academic achievement according to adolescents. We know very well that adolescence is a critical period for developing food and nutrition research. And inadequate food and nutrition literacy may, will contribute to many non-communicable disease and, di and uh, disease burden. And the, uh, the schools are ideal destination for creating synergies, synergies to contribute to development by offering unique chance for the formal education to improve adolescent nutrition lit literacies and their families also. So based on the gap in the, lit gap in the literature, we don't have uh, 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 any data in the Arab world. Thus, we collected, uh, uh, our study was the first and uh, uh, to do, to evaluate the literacy of adolescent uh, and their parents also in uh, 10, uh, around uh, 10 Arab countries. And the hypothesis anticipated that Arab adolescents uh, uh, express low uh, levels of nutrition literacy, uh, 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 stressing the need to reach regional concept in, uh, that integrate nutrition education into Arab schools curricula. So uh, we have, uh, we did collect uh, samples uh, or uh, adolescent and parents from Bahrain, Egypt, Jordan, Kuwait, Palestine, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, UAE, and uh, Morocco, and also from Lebanon. We collected uh, through a, uh, a questionnaire. So it's what, it was online self-administered questionnaire. Uh, and we used the snowballing method. Uh, and we collected around uh, 5,401 adolescent parents' diets uh, that were, who were included in our study. What were the findings in the Arab region? We uh, uh, know uh, that uh, uh, the, the, uh, uh, around uh, uh, 64 or around 65% of uh, these uh, adolescents were having uh, normal body weight and around when uh, that around 30.5% were having, were, uh, were overweight or obese. And the uh, surprise was like 76% of adolescents reported not receiving nutrition education in their school's curriculum. In addition, the proportion of adolescents not receiving nutrition education per country was the highest in Morocco, then followed in Lebanon, Kuwait, Qatar, Palestine. So we have high level of or high percentage of people not receiving nutrition education at schools. 28%, which is a high number according to the global uh, prevalence uh, of uh, people in the Arab world or adolescent with their parents in the Arab world or adolescent, they don't have nutrition literacy. And the highest one was in Qatar. 60% of parents had poor food literacy. And the highest one was in Morocco and Lebanon and Saudi Arabia. So what were the correlate, the determinant? What are the causes of this, uh, uh, this issue? We, we investigated that the female uh, uh, gender, usually the women, they have a higher literacy by 30% uh, compared to males. The age, older adolescent, uh, uh, have more, 60% compared to those who are younger. Also, those who are in the uh, educational level, uh, 
a higher education level, mainly in the first year of universities, they were around five times higher, have more uh, nutrition literacy compared to the younger. And those who are working also, working adolescents, they have 50% more likely to be adequate in nutrition literacy. Those who have nutrition education at school, there were also 30% having more food and nutrition literacy compared to those who don't have nutrition education. So also the overweight parent, uh, uh, they have uh, also, it, it, it was a determinant that increased the literacy, the primary givers who are uh, the, the parents who, who uh, adolescents who have uh, two parents instead of, of, of uh, those who are divorced, also they have more literacy. Uh, if they, they have a healthy parent, also more literacy. Food, lit they, uh, the parents, uh, uh, those who are food literate parents were two times more likely to have adolescents who are also uh, nutritionally uh, literate. So, uh, uh, we know very well that we should uh, propose uh, the, what we call the macro curriculum concept in schools. The macro curriculum should include food and nutrition literacy. And we should do uh, a multiple intervention package to implement, to lead to the best possible nutrition outcomes. So addressing nutrition literacy in our region requires vi vision and governance uh, uh, action that enhance the agility functioning of food system. So we know very well that key stakeholders can change the game by changing education. We also published this uh, uh, paper in the in Frontiers uh, uh, Nutrition. Uh, inshallah, very soon it will be uh, online. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Maha, for your very comprehensive but quick presentation. Uh, we have quite many lessons to take home from this, especially your uh, concept of macro curriculum and how not just modifying the school uh, syllabi, but also to include uh, you know, many more skill-based activities into it as an important takeaway from that. And then uh, I'm sure from LFOF, uh, the quick takeaway that I personally have is to think of a Southeast Asia study on nutrition literacy among adolescents and then find the determinants for nutrition literacy. So it will be very, very useful. Uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, a very um, engaging and uh, thought provoking presentation. Uh, and if there are any quick questions from um, others uh, in the LFOF consortium, you may just raise your hand and then ask question, or uh, we'll also request uh, the audience to post any questions in the chat box or Q and A box. Any questions from the uh, consortium partners who are online, or other participants in the webinar? Okay, we'll quickly move uh, to uh, the next presenter. Uh, may I request uh, my uh, colleague, uh, Dr. Anida, to present our next presenter, to give details about the next presenter? Yes. Good morning, everyone. I'm Dr. Nida Hazari. I'm a project scientist at NIN. Now, I would like to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Chin Siu, Associate Professor, Department of Nutrition, Faculty of Medical and Health Sciences, University Putra, Malaysia. Dr. Chen Siu has specialized in community nutrition and has prompted research on child and adolescent nutrition. She is one of main researchers of the Research Center of Excellence Nutrition and Non-Communicable Chronic Disease. As a community nutritionist, she has been actively organizing various nutrition and health promotion programs in various community settings. She is a member of the Expert Committee of Healthy Kids Program and Malaysia School Nutrition Promotion Program and leads several research-driven community programs like Eat Right to Play Right. Now, I would like to request Dr. Chin Siu to talk on the importance of school-based nutrition education in promotion, uh, in priorities uh, in, uh, in nutrition education for school-age children. 
Okay, uh, before uh, Dr. Chin starts her presentation, uh, Dr. Maha, I hope you'll stay on uh, for a while uh, in the presentation because I have some quick questions to ask you. Uh, okay. And uh, I'll club the questions with um, uh, the after the presentation of uh, Dr. Chin and then I'll ask those questions to you and to her also. Thank you so much. Thank you. I don't know if you are seeing me now. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Yes, Dr. Chen. Thank you. All right. Hello. Thank, uh, thank you for inviting me to be here. Good morning, everyone. So I am Chin. Uh, thanks uh, for having me here. And I'm sharing the title on this importance of school-based nutrition education for developing healthy food practices among adolescents. So in these uh, sharing sessions, I would like to give you a quick overview about the importance of nutrition education for adolescents. And very quickly, I would like to share with you some of the programs which are research-oriented community nutrition programs that we have been conducted over the years, and it's focused on adolescents itself. So these are the importance of nutrition education for adolescents, mainly uh, which we all know about in terms of like, it is very important for the adolescents to start to establish the healthy eating habits during the adolescent stage, whereby it is a lifelong habit itself starting from adolescence. And indeed during this stage, this is the most critical period in terms of their highest needs in terms of their nutrition because they are getting their second chance or even the last chance of having their peak nutrition uh, growth itself. And then for the second is about the prevention of obesity and other health related problems. So this is a very critical period for them to prevent all these chronic diseases before they enter the adulthood. And of course, it is very important for them to have a healthy uh, psychological health, whereby the self-esteem is part of it. And it is also related to nutrition, okay, as well as their academic performance. So schools indeed are uniquely placed uh, to improve the adolescent nutrition. As we know that the school enrollment now is a, a so-called important and it has been like uh, very widespread for children to start uh, to enroll in primary school and also secondary school education. And they spend eight to 10 years, and in Malaysia, they spend in average about 11 years in their school time. So therefore, schools actually is a very uh, important venue for them to um, promote nutrition literacy, um, ensure food security, offer a healthy environment as well as to link the students with this health and nutrition services as well. So this is a, a framework that's a proposed by WHO, UNESCO and UNICEF in terms of the health promoting schools concept that highlight the eight elements from the policies until the school environments that you can see from here. So this is an important uh, framework for us to refer to in terms of uh, planning for school nutrition promotion program. With that, I quickly move into some of the programs that we have been conducted um, in Malaysia setting. So uh, this is one of it. We call this as healthy lifestyle program. Um, in the bracket is Malay uh, words in Malaysia because uh, in Malaysia, our national language is Malay. So most of our programs were conducted in Malay language. So this program focuses on secondary school students who are living in day school hostel. And we publish the findings uh, as indicated in the slide here. And you can see at the side there, um, they are teachers' photos and also the adolescents' photos on this program. It is a three-year teacher-led healthy lifestyle program. And it is focused on uh, after-school program whereby after they finish the school and they go back to their school hostel and this nutrition education is meant for them. So these are some of the topics and also the objectives that are published in the paper itself that you can refer to. So we split uh, the module to two phases, whereby the first phase is during the first year, they have to learn about the basic about um, healthy nutrition, uh, basically on the body weight status, the energy balance concept, healthy eating concept and active living concept on general concept itself. 
Then on the second year, they uh, wish we focus on more to practicality, uh, healthy lifestyle practice, whereby how they can choose the food, how they read the food label and all that. And all these were actually conducted by the teachers who are trained by us nutritionists. And the teachers actually have to run through all the activities first before they conduct to the students. These are the findings that we got it from the um, evaluations itself before and after the programs for all these uh, school students in, in the school hostels. So we see that um, in terms of their um, so-called the changes of the eating behaviors, the lunch, the dinner, and even the mid-morning snacks have improved compared to the control groups who didn't receive the intervention itself. Indeed, the supper have been reduced in terms of uh, the practice itself in the intervention group. Uh, we know that one of the issues that face in the school hostels, children or the adolescents, they prone to eat a supper and skip their dinner. So in our intervention group, uh, we see the improvement on these issues. And you can see here also another part that we always uh, evaluate in uh, nutrition education program, which is the KAP, Knowledge, Attitude and Practice on Nutrition. And the blue color lines are all the intervention groups. So, and the uh, orange color lines are the control groups. So you can see here, um, the intervention groups who receive the nutrition educations that's conducted by the trained air teachers itself, um, they have shown the improvement. Uh, of course, for the attitude, you don't see really like a sharp increase in terms of the attitudes. We know that adolescents, they are a very challenging uh, periods and also target group in terms of uh, attending education sessions. But we do see if, let's say, the control group who are not receiving the educations, their attitudes in terms of the nutrition drop a lot here. Okay, so this actually linked to like disorder eating problems and also the body image problems and all that. And we also capture some information in terms of the feedback with regards to the activities that we conducted because we are not just conducting like classroom based kind of nutrition education activities. We are more into the nutrition interactive activities whereby they learn through the games and activities. So the majority of all these students giving us very positive feedback, they express that the programs itself or the sessions itself are interesting easily understood and they like those activities. And we also get the feedback from the teachers and they actually are giving us very positive feedback, I would say. Um, they themselves also apply the knowledge that they learn through the training session itself and they also apply it to their own family members and also they find it that it is very useful program and it can be extend to all students. Next, I would like to share with you another program which we call it as Apple, okay, which we emphasize on three main components, healthy eating, positive body image, and also active lifestyle. And the program here are focusing on peer lead uh, approach itself, whereby the Form 2 students, which are uh, around 14 years old, they deliver the program to the Form 1 and Form 2 students who are aged uh, 13 and 14 years of their peers. So these are the two papers that we publish for this program itself that you can find more details. So um, I just go very quickly in terms of some background about the study itself. It is a quasi-experimental design. It is indeed a small scale uh, intervention compared to just now. Okay, we have like two schools, one for the intervention and one for the comparison school. And we recruit only the secondary school students without involving the teachers. So we conducted it for 16 weeks. Uh, with the uh, eight sessions over there. And we train the uh, students in uh, our universities. And then those trained students become the peer leader and they conduct the sessions itself. So these are the modules that we develop for the uh, peer leaders. So they have the module and they have the uh, activity books for the students who participate in the program so that they can use it during the program itself. And we also develop some education materials to, uh, used uh, by using this module as well, using together with this module. So these are some topics. You can find it in the paper itself. So they are um, topics and also the key message and also the objectives and activities uh, for you to refer as well. And these are the findings that we um, found from this Apple program. So we managed to find um, a significant uh, improvement in terms of the knowledge, but no difference in terms of their attitude and practice. 
Okay, uh, although we see that the control group actually have a more, uh, uh, so-called has little bit more um, increased compared to the in, uh, in intervention group, but there is not significant in terms of that. As for the waist circumference in terms of like the anthropometric indicators, the waist circumference actually we see that the intervention group have uh, so-called less uh, increase compared to the control group. Okay, we don't really aim for reductions because they are all a majority of them are normal weight. Just a small percentage of them are having overweight and obesity problems. Okay, so this is another program which uh, we actually integrate two components here. We integrate the nutrition education and also the school canteen component, which is the supportive um, environment for the children or actually the adult, early adolescents to practice. Uh, whatever they learn in the nutrition education session. So we come up with a menu, okay? This menu is in Malay language and also Chinese language as well. So um, we have this menu for, uh, we have 20 menus in this uh, book itself that's meant for one month time and every uh, recipes are all different. And uh, we have the modules that adapted from Nutrition Society of Malaysia itself. We don't develop a new module. And then we involve uh, six primary schools and we train the teachers, uh, 41 teachers involved in this uh, from these six primary schools and 523 um, students, okay, from uh, even standard one to standard five. So we do include um, the younger children as well, um, non, non adolescent group. So the trained teachers actually conducted the three healthy lifestyle campaigns to the students during the school holidays. So again, it is um, out of the school's uh, learning time. Uh, it is very challenging to involve uh, the children when they are studying. So these are the changes in terms of their K, A, and P. So we can see like their knowledge is improved. As for the attitude and practice, the control group actually reduced. But for the um, intervention group, we can see a steady improvement over time. And this is the findings in terms of their eating behaviors. We see that they have improved their eating behaviors mainly on the breakfast, lunch, dinner, and even the morning tea, afternoon tea as well. As for the physical activity, we also see the improvement in our intervention group compared to the control group. As well as uh, for the BMI for age, uh, we see that actually uh, the control group that didn't receive any interventions, they have the increase in terms of their BMI. But for the intervention group, we do see a decreasing trend, but there is, it is not significant yet uh, uh, due, due to the limitations of the intervention, I would say. As for the cognitive performance, as one of the indicators here also, um, we see the improvement in terms of the uh, cognitive performance in our intervention group compared to our control group. So with that, uh, come to my conclusions here. So school indeed is a very uh, important and unique place for us to improve adolescent nutrition and health professionals like us, our nutrition group, we have to continue to implement the school-based nutrition promotion programs for adolescents. What we have to work uh, on is we have to be very creative and we need to adapt to different situations. Um, like previously, we have like COVID-19 pandemic and all that, we actually conduct the sessions online. So we have to change our activities to online activities. So these are very important and it is very important for us to not just giving them um, educations per se, but it's more towards aiming to empower them uh, with the knowledge and also the skills to practice the healthy eating and active lifestyle, and then further contribute towards elevations of the burden of malnutrition and improve their quality of life. Therefore, the continuous efforts to engage with stakeholders in schools are very important. As you can see from the programs that we work on, we are not just working on ourselves, just university. We work with the schools, we work with the teachers, we work with the parents. Um, so you need to work with different stakeholders so that we can uh, work together to promote healthy eating and active lifestyle and improve the nutritional status of the adolescents. With that, thank you for your kind attention. Thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Chen. And uh, yeah, I mean, we've had two broad perspectives from two different parts of the world. Uh, which again and again reiterate that nutrition education is not just enough. It has to be skill-based. It has to be engaging so that it 
turns into a real literacy which can help the adolescents to put to use the skills uh, for making their food choices. If there are any quick questions we'll take for both the speakers before we move to the Indian perspective. Uh, I already see Dr. Zoya's question in the chat box. Uh, Dr. Zoya, would you like to ask the question yourself to Dr. Maha or should I uh, do it? Yeah. Uh, you can just read it out. Uh, it's not that. I was just wondering, I found it very funny that even parents who are overweight or obese, their children also have better knowledge. So, is, uh, so that I kind of, kind of found it contradictory. That's why I put that question there. Yeah, uh, Dr. Maha, I think Dr. Zoya's question is about uh, overweight and obese parents and their children uh, seeking better nutrition knowledge or having better nutrition knowledge. And how is it possible? Um, can you just throw some light on that? Okay, so uh, concerning this association, because uh, parents were more uh, interested to resolve the problem of obesity among their household, they will, will care more and they also uh, introduce the concept of nutrition education and how to eat at their homes. So it, it is a kind of double uh, uh, side uh, uh, way of improving the nutrition education. Uh, we know that uh, uh, having obesity at at how in the household is not uh, the, the 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 stimulus or the stimulant factor to inter to introduce the concept of nutrition in uh, the families. But uh, according to our observation, to our study, to our statistic, because it's a high sample size, it was shown that the obesity among parents. Uh, improve the nutrition knowledge for their kids, for their adolescents. Perhaps it's also, yeah, perhaps it's also that the parents don't want their children yeah. to be like them and they encourage them to, uh, you know, seek better be nutrition. Better. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, to be better. And you know, I also, another thing but, which I think Monica has also written, which uh, Dr. Heath also mentioned is that having knowledge doesn't really lead to behavior change also. And that yeah, I thought yes. is yeah. so true, especially in, in case of young children. It's true, and that's the reason why nutrition literacy has yes. to be engaging and skill based. <laughs> yes, uh, yes. Is what we say. Yeah, uh, uh, Prithu has a question, please. Yes. Uh, thank you so much for both the sessions. So I have a question for both the speakers that what was the feedback of the teachers when they have to dedicate additional time to promote nutrition literacy? So we would like to know the teacher's experience and some insights on that as well. Thank you. Dr. Chin, would you want to go first? Okay, so um, feedback from the teachers, we have two extreme end, whereby uh, at one end, they find it very useful as I shared in the screen just now in terms of like the knowledge and also the skills that they have. And it's not just meant for their routine job to transfer it to the children as being instructed um, and being trained by us. But at another end, um, they find it is stressful for them to manage it because it adds on another burden and another task for them. Uh, we all know that teachers have to manage many things already. So when we train them and they have to find time to actually um, to conduct the sessions for the children and they need to prepare the materials, it creates another burden. So what we try to actually reduce the burden while we still need the teachers to be the one to conduct the sessions as a nationwide program itself, so we actually prepare the kids uh, systematically and told them in terms of uh, these are the materials for session one, two, and three. And we train them how to use it from the very beginning during the training sessions. And we giving them the flexibility in terms of like one month only conduct one topic. So they don't really have to conduct it every day and it use a long duration. So those are the um, things that we, we have in our previous programs. Okay, uh, I think um, uh, Dr. Monica and uh, Dr. Vani have some points to make. Uh, Dr. Vani's question is, what is the best program indicator uh, which can be used to monitor skill-based nutrition sessions in the schools? Yeah, I think my question is also associated with that. And then I'll ask this question to uh, Dr. Maha. What, is, what are the parameters on which you assess nutrition literacy in various countries among adolescents, among the um, other uh, groups of parents and others that you uh, assess? Is there any scale to assess that? And if so, how it was uh, localized or how it was, it was customized to the local uh, groups? 
Okay, uh, so as I understand, uh, we have many tools that assess the food literacy and nutrition literacy that was validated, that were validated before, but not in the Arab countries. So uh, these tools were validated uh, to assess the nutrition literacy, checking for the parameters of knowledge, of uh, kind of practice about uh, uh, how many fruits per day, um, of the, the kind of food and association with health. So uh, uh, questions like that. And also with regards to the uh, nutrition literacy uh, about uh, uh, the eating patterns, for example, at night, what should they eat in the, at the breakfast. So these kind of tools were validated before and also uh, were translated to, the, to, to Arabic and back translated to English to be used in our local uh, 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 community or local population. So uh, currently, uh, we don't have uh, um, frequent tools to assess uh, the food and nutrition literacy in the Arab world, but we, uh, I checked the literature and there is uh, a systematic review that shows uh, a compilation of uh, food and nutrition literacy around the world. It's common, it's more common in China because they were, I guess, the first uh, people to uh, work on interventions in uh, schools for uh, 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 nutrition and food literacy and also then followed by USA people and then followed by Malaysia and India and uh, many other uh, population. So, uh, we still, at the Arab region, we lack this uh, kind of tools. I don't know if in uh, other uh, countries or uh, in other region, if they have their own uh, uh, food and nutrition literacy uh, tools, but uh, we don't have it yet in okay. uh, our countries. Okay, I think uh, um, Dr. Pritha is requesting to share your tools so that we can also check them for this. And then as regards Dr. Vani's question about uh, what are the tools to check at the program level whether uh, you, uh, the, the skill-based nutrition education sessions are working or not? Uh, Dr. Chin, do you have any uh, particular indicators that you looked at? Uh, you know, you've generally gone through the uh, nutrition profile and then eating habits and things like that. But at a program level, as an indicator, uh, can we identify something? Say, if we were to implement this in Indian context or any other context in a program, programmatic approach. How uh, and what are those indicators that we look at? If you have, uh, yeah. Uh, this is the question for me or for uh, Dr. Chen? Dr. Dr. Chen, yeah. Okay. Uh, or Dr. Maha, you want to say something first? No, oh. no, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> it's okay. All right. Um, so in terms of, we don't really have a so-called validated tool for that because uh, we conducted some programs mainly on the teachers. They went back to their schools and we are at the central point. So what we do is we prepare like a checklist for them to highlight to us what they did. And then they share the photos. So we are collecting in terms of some qualitative data instead of uh, validated instruments for that. Yeah, okay. a checklist, okay. photos and interviews. Okay. Okay, and then there is one more question by Dr. Uh, uh, Sanjay. Uh, I think we'll park this question to a later uh, stage because this needs to be raised even in the panel discussion. What about uh, the children who are not going to schools? How to get nutrition literacy to them? Uh, that also, because today's uh, e-dialogue title is school age children, not necessarily those who are going to school alone. So we'll, we'll look at this uh, at a later uh, stage. And I'm sure there are many more questions coming up, but uh, these are two interesting presentations. We'll move to the Indian perspective in the interest of the time, and then we'll come back uh, to these questions at the time of panel discussion. Uh, if our speakers are still staying on with us, they can still join the panel discussion. Uh, may I request uh, my colleague to introduce our next speaker? Paramita? Okay, please go ahead. It's my pleasure to um, invite our next speaker, Dr. Monica Arora. 
She's the Vice President, Research and Health Promotion, Public Health Foundation of India. Dr. Arora is a public health scientist. She works in the area of non-communicable disease prevention and control in adolescent health. She's the founding GB member of the health of the Healthy India Alliance and President-elect of the Global NCD Alliance. Madam is also the key driver of Let's Fix Our Food initiative. I request Dr. Arora to share her valuable views on the topic, policy research on adolescent health and obesity prevention. Over Thank to you, ma'am. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. I will just uh, switch my slides. Is my screen visible? Yes, ma'am. Great. Okay, so very interesting discussion. And I thank the previous two speakers uh, because my presentation becomes much easier uh, having that background available. Uh, the interesting discussion about indicators, uh, some of it um, is covered in uh, this presentation as well. But just to provide an Indian context to uh, the problem, which Dr. Subarao uh, did talk about briefly, I would only like to mention that the recent World Obesity Federation report highlights a stark increase which is projected in prevalence of obesity in India. And um, this is uh, what we are seeing not only in urban setup, but also we are seeing increase in rural and both among boys, girls, men, women. So um, we are uh, looking at a dual burden because we have to address um, undernutrition, though on this slide we do see that there is a rapid uh, reduction in stunting, uh, wasting, women who are thin, men who are thin, but there is also increase in overweight obesity. And though these uh, prevalence numbers may look small, but if we look at the population level impact of these uh, and the numbers in India, this will be a huge burden on our health system. So um, with that, uh, I would like to emphasize that India needs a syndemic approach to simultaneously address both overweight obesity and undernutrition. And the government programs uh, will just need to uh, have the messaging and campaign in a mode uh, which is uh, much more uh, cohesive for incorporating both these uh, inputs. Now, uh, I will quickly talk about the uh, burden, which is uh, in other um, uh, parts, uh, like in schools particularly. So if we look at some of our studies, which have looked at food environment, so uh, a recent study conducted by PHFI with WHO India uh, in schools and colleges of Delhi and NCR, our participants included not only the students in schools and colleges, uh, both private and government schools, but also uh, included teachers, um, parents, as well as canteen operators, because it is very important and we have been hearing that just providing information through school curriculum or a health promotion curriculum will not bring about behavior change. It is the environment which is actually influencing their behaviors. So in order to understand that environment, we looked at environment inside the school, canteens, and immediately outside the schools because in our government schools, we do have students eating food which is available immediately outside the school gate. So um, very interesting findings was availability of foods and beverage option in and around these educational institutions were either high in fat, salt, or sugar. Despite uh, we having uh, very strict policies around uh, restricting the availability of such food items in and around school, this is happening. Healthy food and beverage op options were expensive compared to HFSS food options, both inside and outside the school. And students from all the private schools were exposed to food and beverage advertisements as well. And uh, these advertisements were not around the government schools, but these were in the private school setup. These advertisements were seen. So these advertisements are influencing their choices, is uh, making their environment obesogenic. So obviously the food choices and something they keep seeing, it's like nudge. Uh, these advertisements would provide a nudge for them to go and buy these food items. 
Another study, uh, which again emphasizes on the problem uh, that we are seeing uh, currently of overweight obesity among school children is TV advertisements. Another study undertaken by PHFI as a cross-sectional study in 2020 was content analysis of the TV advertisements. And we looked separately at the TV channels which were targeting children, young children and youth. And we realized that the higher proportion of food advertisements, which were HFSS advertisements, were seen on children's channels. So these food product companies know very well that behaviors get etched at a very young age. So they have to start uh, including them uh, to choose their products right from an early age. Whereas compared to youth channels, uh, there were fewer of these advertisements. But majority of the food which was advertised was HFSS food, irrespective of children's channel or youth channel, day type, whether it was a weekday or weekend. So we analyzed all of these um, content of advertising using the uh, Informas protocol, which was adapted to our Indian context. Another study uh, which looked at uh, India is doing extensive work on school health programs. And uh, we did a rapid review of various programs. Uh, this was using WHO uh, tool for rapid assessment of implementation of adolescent health and school health programs. And uh, it was realized that India's both national adolescent health program and school health program, they align very well with the priority actions for World Health Organization's framework for delivering universal health coverage for adolescents. So we are um, doing very well on that framework. However, uh, what needs to be done is this behavior change uh, that we want to bring about. And behavior change requires extensive programming, which has to be uh, scientifically developed. Second issue uh, under burden that we need to look at is the stigma, which is associated with obesity. So our health system, as I said, is ill-equipped to address obesity. Uh, we uh, definitely, in the clinical side, we need quality guidelines for preliminary assessment and treatment. We require healthcare professional training. Financial barriers to services need to be addressed. Also, uh, people who are taking treatment for obesity do face a lot of uh, stigma. And uh, this also requires that apart from school interventions, we look at the larger um, environment of obesity prevention. So uh, quickly coming to what have been some of our interventions uh, which have been successful. I am starting with uh, one example because very early on we tested a model in tobacco control, which was uh, for preventing tobacco use through a group randomized trial. And this two years intervention very clearly showed that interventions given to school children over two years brought down tobacco use by 17% in intervention group. And actually, if we do not intervene, control group actually saw an increase of 68%. So that is the importance in our Indian context to bring about interventions in the school setting. So this model was a, a very comprehensive intervention model. Um, so very important lesson from this was that interventions should be planned following a behavior change intervention model. They should not be planned just because we feel a poster has to be done or a morning assembly lecture has to be done. There has to be a, a behavior change uh, model, which is theory-based. Uh, our lessons were peer-led engagement was very, very important because that led to ownership of the issue. And these uh, peer leaders became the health activists uh, to bring about changes, not only in the school environment, but also in the home and community environment. So there was this discussion about, you know, what happens to out of school um, adolescents who are not going to school. So this had a component of once in year one, they became uh, uh, health advocates. They uh, were able to understand the ill effects of tobacco use. They actually adopted neighborhood community. And if you see, they took the messages to the community, to the adolescents who were out of school to have the same behavior change happen in the community setting as well. 
So this model was adopted by the government of India and it is uh, now a school health program in tobacco control are actually part of India's national tobacco control program using the same materials which adolescents had developed under this uh, model in co-creation. So we adapted some of these learnings to diabetes awareness and prevention education in schools. Uh, this was again uh, with sixth and seventh grade students. We undertook a uh, two years uh, intervention study and uh, we did baseline survey orientation workshop for peer leaders and teacher coordinators, very interactive playway uh, activities with board games uh, given to uh, school students and um, student worksheets as well given. So uh, after one year of intervention, we saw very uh, remarkable changes in their behaviors. So there was, if you see, uh, an increase in vegetable consumption and decline in all the unhealthy food consumption of carbonated drinks, fried snacks, Indian sweets, packaged chips. Now, um, under this, we did realize that just again, individual behavior change is not enough because they can go back home and uh, then they can be consuming these food items. So we adopted another program in the school setting, which was Project Kids, which was to address students both who had type one diabetes and for prevention of type two diabetes. And this aimed at changing the canteen policies as well. So adolescents themselves were involved in designing their school canteen policies. So there was ownership of the issue. Now, because they are the ones who said this will be our canteen menu, they would not desist. Had it come from a health organization or had it come from school, they would have revolted. But they are the ones who debated and made their own uh, canteen policies that led to uh, a change, a sub a sustainable change in their behaviors. And um, all of this is evaluated. The teachers themselves felt they greatly benefited from these interventions, apart from engagement of parents as well as uh, uh, the school um, management and the students. Uh, project I Promise was promoting health literacy in schools, and uh, this was a two-year intervention. And if you see the uh, duration of the study, it was during COVID. So study design was a cluster randomized trial with um, eight uh, private schools uh, randomly selected. And uh, when we were doing the intervention, COVID stuck, and second year of intervention was all through digital modules. But still, we were able to see positive change uh, due to the intervention. Many studies have reported actually during COVID, the eating behaviors were negatively impacted. Physical activity was negatively impacted. But with this intervention, we were able to see positive change in uh, the intervention schools, uh, both on nutrition and physical activity, as well as intake of daily uh, vegetable uh, in their diet. So. Uh, as I said, that having literacy in the school setup, nutrition literacy is one part, but we have to take some campaigns as well. So uh, physical activity is second part of preventing overweight obesity. So uh, we undertook a campaign which was engaging the community, not just the school, to be physically active. And families were involved and encouraged to come for walks, jogs, uh, runs as well as there was a ground miles app, uh, which at that point was an innovative concept that they could count their steps. And uh, again, this motivated a lot of uh, adolescents to be physically active. Here is a curriculum we designed for uh, the government, uh, for Ministry of Development of Northeastern Region, where they wanted a comprehensive school health uh, curriculum to be written for them. And as you see, NCD is just one part of it, but applying the models uh, to all uh, other health themes, we were able to cover uh, mental health, uh, substance abuse, injuries and violence, nutrition and physical activity, all uh, the themes were covered in a comprehensive module, which was developed for Northeast according to their needs after we undertook formative research. So uh, all those experiences have now been brought into Let's Fix Our Food, uh, which uh, Dr. Subarao talked about briefly. 
And uh, here I would like to highlight that our outcomes, if you see our reduction in consumption of foods high in fat, salt, and sugars, increase in physical activity, and decrease in screen time. So we have just come to the first step where we have developed policy papers on all the five themes which were identified. However, this is a long-term engagement project where our ultimate aim would be to see change in all of these uh, behaviors that we had identified at the start of this study. Adolescent engagement um, is something which is ongoing. Webinars and training of NGOs in Jharkhand was done to be able to do similar analysis of TV advertisements as we did at the national level. Um, also capacity building of adolescents via workshops have been undertaken. So we already have a consortium of adolescents who are now ready to take a uh, plunge into leading several of these campaigns in the entire country because our uh, survey uh, included all the states of India and we have a ready uh, uh, force to start working on uh, implementing the recommendations of this work. As uh, Dr. Subarao had mentioned, this is a consortium. We are engaging youth networks across all the organizations to amplify the knowledge products which have been uh, created. So very engaging um, uh, knowledge products led by adolescents, which is very, very rewarding because they engaged with uh, public health leaders to be able to get engaged in their campaign. There have been um, editorials, opinion pieces written by several of uh, the public health experts and by adolescents themselves. They have created testimonial videos uh, as well as so much of social media presence we see on this topic, which will definitely bring about the change that uh, we are envisaging through this project. Quickly, uh, the results of this survey, and this is not a very scientific survey, I must say, this was more of just trying to capture what adolescents think about the food environment. And uh, if you see the questions that we have asked, consumption of unhealthy food items can be prevented by. So if you see, they are saying that uh, they would be able to uh, bring about um, a reduction in consumption. 43.8% uh, adolescents uh, responded that availability of more information about unhealthy food items will prevent them from consuming such foods. Uh, whereas evidence actually shows that it is the taxes which will actually uh, bring about the maximum change, but this is what adolescents feel. Uh, so we need to have campaigns around those issues and also enhance their uh, knowledge on some of these policy measures and understanding. Food choices uh, are influenced by food environment very clearly. 67.5% of adolescents indicated, yes, their food choices are influenced by advertising. So uh, restrictions on advertising is an important policy measure. Respondents' uh, views on barriers which are restricting eating healthy food, they very clearly they said because these are expensive. So here we very clearly see that their behaviors actually are being influenced by the cost. And uh, their most important source of nutrition information are the schools. So about 49.4% reported that they look for nutrition information from schools. So uh, very clearly we are in the right direction and um, uh, this uh, work has led to these key recommendations that we need a social behavior change communication campaign. And we are presenting these to Niti Aayog because these five areas were actually identified in the beginning of the project with uh, guidance of Niti Aayog. Um, health taxes in India, we have done a, a study which very clearly highlights that we need additional health tax of 20 to 30% on sweets and confectionaries and health tax of 32% to be considered for sugar sweetened beverages if we have to bring down the consumption of these products. Mm. We need similar studies on fat uh, as well to understand what are the right levels of um, taxing salt and fat products as well. 
Regulating food advertisements will definitely protect children and adolescents. And through our analysis, we have identified that the existing guidelines for prevention of misleading advertisement and endorsement of misleading advertisements act of 2022, which is under the Consumer Protection Authority, is a very comprehensive uh, guideline which can be expanded uh, to include for uh, protecting children from these advertisements. And meaningful adolescent engagement is very important. We have seen with this co-creation, how we can amplify the voices of adolescents and foster a healthy food environment. So to conclude, I would just like to say that obesity currently requires not only a campaign uh, in a health promotion mode, we require disease prevention through a comprehensive model, intervention model, which is a behavior change intervention model, theory-based run over several years. Only then we will be able to demonstrate change. It requires the diagnosis, treatment, management of obesity in the Indian context. So let's focus on prevention and treatment, both aspects of it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Monica, for that comprehensive uh, overview. I think uh, things are very clear. What has worked with uh, diabetes prevention and tobacco consumption prevention can also work with uh, HFS's food, dissuading from HFS's food consumption. Uh, and uh, some of the interventions that you have shown are very interesting. I often question uh, gets asked about the scalability of them. I think we'll take up this in the uh, subsequent session and question and answer. In the interest of the time, we'll move to the next speaker quickly. Now I would welcome our last speaker for the session, Dr. Radhika Hedau. She's a nutritionist and an assistant professor at the Symbiosis International University. Dr. Radhika has more than 15 years of experience in varied fields of nutrition, including hospitals, academia, and research. She has been recognized as a global nutrition education influencer uh, for the delivery of school, for uh, nutrition education delivery of school children by Education Influence Australia. She has been associated with a number of initiatives like Nutri Parshala, Nutri Buddies, Nutri Entertainment for imparting nutrition education for school children. She has also developed Nutri Education Guide, by a program for promoting health and nutrition among non-nutrition university students. She has worked as a panelist and a food consultant for designing nutritious menu for varied schools. I welcome her to talk about the nutrient content in Indian school curriculum. Over to you, Radhika, Dr. Radhika. Thank you so much, uh, Paramita. I'll quickly share my screen. So, uh, thank you very much, um, ICMR, NIL, and Dr. Subarao, sir for this uh, excellent opportunity to discuss uh, uh, in this uh, uh, e-dialogue series of priorities in nutrition, uh, education for school age children, the nutrition content in Indian school curriculum. I have been uh, listening to the excellent speakers and actually my presentation is very much in sync and is actually uh, talking about the need for this curriculum. So, uh, we had done this brief study, which was on quantitative appraisal of uh, the uh, content which is offered with respect to nutrition, lifestyle, and food safety uh, in the upper primary and the high school textbooks of NCRT, CBSC, and State Board of Maharashtra. So uh, quickly, I'll be telling about the background, the rationale, the methodology, the results of this quantitative appraisal, the contents which are present in the syllabus, the key findings, and the update on nutrition curriculum with respect to the content. So if we look at uh, why adolescents, I think I need not talk about it, but very briefly, we know that we are the major chunk of the Indian population. Adolescents are 253 billion, or you can say it is 21% of the Indian population. But at the same time, our adolescent population is also 
uh, struggling with the triple burden of malnutrition. We see the visible form of malnutrition in the form of obesity and in the form of thinness. And also we see it in the form of the hidden hunger. That is the micronutrient malnutrition. In fact, one in two adolescents are actually struggling with all these uh, six deficiencies which are mentioned. Also, when we are talking about adolescence, it is the next milestone phase after infancy. So a lot of physical, cognitive, emotional and social changes uh, take place in an adolescent. And uh, an adolescent primarily, if you look at uh, the statistics, uh, we know that in 2000. 18, uh, we had a lot of enrollments. Uh, in It is uh, roughly around 135 uh, million un, uh, enrollments, which we see in the uh, schools here as per the Kaval uh, 2021 study. And the Indian schooling system, if we see, it is one of the largest uh, system and it caters to 250 million students. So schools, we know, uh, as our uh, other speakers have also been emphasizing, that it is a hub which provides this continuous nutrition education in a holistic manner. This is a place where children actually spend the majority of their time. So this calls for a very interactive uh, nutrition literacy and a robust nutrition curriculum where we are giving them education in the form of textbooks also plays a very, very important role. Now, uh, already this has been discussed that when we are talking about literacy, it is basically, you know, uh, the basic reading, writing skills, the cognitive skills, the analysis, and also Im uh, implementation of these skills, and also participation in the research studies which are related with these skills, which has been uh, discussed already by Dr. Maha. So what we have found is uh, that with respect to the contents, uh, though there have been many curriculums which have been imparted or they have been, uh, they have been um, uh, running simultaneously. Uh, in the textbooks, we have found that so far in India, there is only a single study which has been done uh, by Dr. Subbarao and the other co-authors where they have uh, seen uh, the quantitative as well as the qualitative appraisal of uh, the nutrition and the food safety content which is offered in the curriculum. And food and nutrition curriculum or, uh, you know, the contents is actually not a core part of the school curriculum. And in fact, more importance is given to the physical sciences compared to the biological sciences. So uh, if you look at the rationale for this study was that uh, we know that if this content gets incorporated or if this information is blended into the existing curriculum of various subjects across, uh, you know, uh, the variety of subjects that they are learning, the English, Hindi, math, social sciences, then no extra time has to be devoted by teachers to teach the nutrition, healthy living and food safety. So uh, there is a need to examine and evaluate this particular curriculum. And therefore, our aim was to look into uh, the analysis of the content which is given in textbooks of NCRT and State Board of Maharashtra for upper primary and high school textbooks from 6 to 10 standard. So our objectives were to access, uh, access, uh, access this uh, content, which is related with nutrition, lifestyle, and food safety, to quantify this content, and then to compare this content between the two boards. So this was basically a cross-sectional observational study. So we had taken the CBSC and the Maharashtra State Board curriculum, and we uh, considered these two curricula because these are very popularly followed here in India and also in this uh, city of Pune. And uh, we included the CBSC and CRT textbooks, and for State Board, we included the Bal Bharti textbooks. Now, the contents that we considered for the science textbooks were food, nutrients, nutrition, physical activity, sleep, mental health, drug, tobacco, alcohol consumption, non-communicable diseases, no, uh, nutritional deficiencies, and infectious diseases. Now, the contents that we excluded were physics, chemistry, environmental sciences, and reproductive health. We had also taken the non-science subjects such as English, Hindi, mathematics, and social science, and we tried to see if at all any content related with nutrition, food safety, or lifestyle is included. So uh, we uh, did the quantitative analysis where we took the physical measurements of chapters, pages, lines, illustrations, and activities which are dedicated to nutrition, lifestyle, and food safety. Uh, 
we coded this uh, content uh, 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 as per the chapters, the pages, lines, illustrations in, num uh, in numbers. And then we used frequencies and percentages uh, and we quantified it against the total number of chapters and pages which were there in the textbooks under the study. The, we also did an intercoder reliability test and we actually checked it against the Cohen's Kappa. And then we also uh, statistically analyzed and compared the contents which is offered in NCRT and state board school textbooks. So what we found here is if you look at the table, uh, the food and nutrition content in sixth grade is offered maximum actually. Um, so two chapters are dedicated to foods and nutrition content in NCRT. And uh, if you see in lines, if you see in pages or illustrations and activities, these are much more. Then again, in grade seven, that is further going down. Where I put an asterisk, it is basically, you know, just few lines which are devoted or just a, a minor part which is devoted. Again, in uh, eighth standard, only a smaller section is devoted. Then um, if you look into uh, the eighth grade, again, the pages, one and a half page is the only page as uh, compared to the 239 pages, which are actually devoted for that entire te uh, textbook. Uh, then in ninth standard, again, we will see the pages and the lines are, you know, hardly half a page is devoted here. And with respect to food safety, if you see, it is only half a page or even 53 lines. In grade 10, we see again for foods and nutrition, it is five pages which have been devoted. And for drug, alcohol and tobacco or smoking, it is only one fourth of the pages are, de are devoted. So the asterisk indicates a subtopic which is included in the chapter. It is not the entire chapter which has been dedicated. And the figures which you see in parenthesis in indicate the total number of chapters in the pages. Now, this is for the State Board of Maharashtra, the Bal Bharti textbooks. Here also we see that in sixth standard, the majority of the portions for food and nutrition are actually covered. Uh, one chapter is dedicated for foods and nutrition and for food safety, it is one fourth of the page as we see. Then again, in grade seventh, we see that uh, two and a half pages are dedicated for food safety and only half a page is dedicated for food and nutrition content. And illustrations we see, there are a few illustrations which are seen in food safety for grade seven. Then in grade eight also, if we see very less uh, content with respect to food, uh, physical activity, sleep, mental health, food safety, or drugs and alcohol or tobacco smoking has been dedicated. The similarly, if we see uh, uh, in uh, grade nine, again, if we see there are just uh, you know, five pages which are dedicated on food safety. So what I want to mention here is that the contents are not very consistent and you know, they're very sporadically scattered here. Now, this is for, again, grade 10. Uh, if we see, it is only half a page. Now, mental health is, again, Government of India is taking a lot of um, um, you know, programs and initiatives with respect to mental health. And in Bal Bharti, half a page is de dedicated uh, to the mental health status. And for drugs and alcohol, it is only one eighth of the page. It is very, very minute uh, content, which is given with respect to drug, alcohol, or tobacco, or smoking. Now, uh, with respect to the content analysis of the non-science subjects like social science, mathematics, English, and Hindi, we don't see any of the content which is dedicated except for in grade nine, the food security concepts are included in social sciences. Similarly, in uh, state board school in Bal Bharti textbooks, again, social science includes food security concepts. We also did an, uh, uh, there are optional subjects which are seen in state board where they are giving some information on food preservation, bakery products and beautification. Now, under beautification, actually, they have a very small section devoted to um, the importance of nutrition. So it is again, not very much evident, evidently captured. Um, we also actually checked it, uh, uh, the Cohen uh, Kappa we found, we did an intercoder reliability test and we found it to be 0 0.69 and 0 0.79. And we found a substantial moderate agreement between the two coders for the CBSE and the state board school. And we found that in terms of content, when we tried to uh, analyze by scoring the contents and statistically observe, there was no significant content with respect to the CBSC or the state board schools. So these are the few contents which are actually mentioned uh, in the uh, NCRT and in the Bal Bharti textbooks. So 
we need more information with respect to lifestyle, as I said, or the holistic nutrition. So our key findings say that in NCRT and in Balbati textbooks, the nutrition content was covered maximum in the uh, sixth standard compared to any other grade. And the other lifestyle components, which are very important, which are determining the nutritional status of any adolescent, such as stress, sleep, physical activity, uh, you know, they were they were covered in very, very in a scattered manner and uh, they need to be covered in a more advanced fashion, just like how a curriculum is designed as per the grades and standards. There are no gold standard recommendations for a healthy lifestyle for adolescents which have been included. For example, a WHO recommendation for 60 minutes of moderate to rigorous physical activity or the screen time recommendations. These are not really included in the textbooks. The food safety and the health and disease content was covered very partially from grade 8 to 10 standard. Very few lines were dedicated to the ill effects of consumption of alcohol or smoking. So our recommendations are that uh, we want to propose a robust nutrition curriculum where it is blended across all the subjects, keeping in mind the aptitude of the students. And also there is a scope of uh, pro of. Uh, focusing on the skill-based nutrition information. We have been hearing uh, from all the speakers and also Dr. Subarao sir is summarizing that a skill-based capacity enhancement curriculum has to be there. However, if these skill-based nutrition information is given from a seat to plate approach uh, where it is um, involving nutrition and food safety and lifestyle, it is going to be very useful. And uh, the textbook content should also be updated and aligned with respect to the health promoting school guidelines, which are given and the eat right school guidelines also, which are given by FSACI. So uh, apart from the interactive curriculum or the activities, it's very important that the children also read and in that reading, if interaction with respect to activities, with respect to assignments or the evaluations is conducted, it would it is going to be much more beneficial. The syllabus also needs to be uh, allied with the uh, nutrition education policy, which has actually prioritized the holistic health. So um, there are many updates which are actually, there are many studies which uh, uh, our eminent speakers have actually spoken on the curriculum. But here I would like to emphasize on the national education policy, which has given a higher priority on children's health and their nutrition. However, an update in the textbooks uh, is very much uh, required in connection with education. And it has actually uh, stressed on the importance of holistic nutrition or holistic health and children's health. FSSCI has already taken up a lot of series of initiatives. There is Eat Right School Initiative also, which is there. Uh, and it has also developed a content repo, uh, repository, which can be added into the school curriculum, which can be done by schools. And if there is um, uh, a provision where, you know, they can have certain textbooks where uh, this can be uh, added into the curricula, that would be beneficial. Also, there is this Tarang Health Alliance, which has started this year-long year trials, which are on imparting the health education. And in this, they are giving a lot of worksheets apart from the interactive curriculum. These are my references. So thank you very much, ICMR and I team, Dr. Subarao, sir, for this wonderful opportunity. And I thank my co-author, uh, Ms. Navya Kutti. And uh, many thanks to all the teachers of the CBSC and the state board schools and the principal who have supported uh, and cooperated in this particular study by giving us a library access and go through the different uh, books and the curricula that is offered. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Radhika. Thank you. Your presentation again reiterates uh, that there is not much of a change in the curriculum since we've analyzed way back in 2012 or 13, I don't remember. Uh, there is nutrition component, but it is scattered. It is not continuous. And most important topics are not uh, dealt with. This is the take home message. And then I wish you had done some amount of qualitative analysis also in terms of what is covered and how it is covered and what are the slant that they're taking. That would also help uh, go a little uh, forward in uh, terms of understanding the content in the school science curriculum. Yes, I think uh, we are already delayed in uh, terms of our timeline. We'll quickly have a round of introduction of our panelists and then we'll move to the panel discussion. 
in the panel discussion we'll have some pointed questions to each of the panelists who would give their views and then we will uh, also open it up for the uh, other speakers and other uh, consortium partners to ask any uh, questions uh, to the panelists. Uh, and if time permits, I'll have a last say in terms of summarizing the five key takeaways that I usually do in the dialogue series. Yes, please. Let us uh, begin our panel discussion with a very dynamic personality, Dr. Zoya Ali Rizvi, Deputy Commissioner, Ministry of Health and Family Welfare. Dr. Rizvi is a meritorious and hardworking doctor, having vast experience at various levels of the government health sector. She is an alumnus and gold medalist from King George Medical College, Lucknow, and the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Currently, she heads the National Adolescent Health Program and the School Health and Wellness Program under Aishman Bharat Scheme for promotive and preventive healthcare of adolescents and school children. May I request you, ma'am, to please throw some light on the perspectives of the Education Board on priorities in nutrition education for school age children. Over to you, ma'am. Yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Nida. Uh, uh, I would just like to first, uh, first begin by saying so much what I have, of what I had thought I will say has already been covered. You know? so, so I have to basically go back and rethink. But it is really so interesting and enlightening to hear so much is happening across the world uh, with respect to children in the education system. So taking it from there, I just want to uh, briefly talk about the program, which is School Health and Wellness Program, which is basically a partnership program between health and education, in which as per the national education policy, which was again mentioned uh, by Dr. Hedow also, is that the importance of putting nutrition on the forefront to achieve good uh, educational goals as well. Uh, so in this partnership, there's the 50% ownership is with the education and the uh, 50 is with health. We're training school teachers because what I think all these studies also have shown that teachers carry an immense weight, both in informing children, both in supporting and improving the knowledge and also interacting as kind of change makers when parents are involved. And this information also reaches community. So using teachers for informing children and through children, their parents and through parents, the community is something which we are hoping to have a long lasting effect. And as again was mentioned by so many speakers, uh, SBCC, social behavior change and communication is something which is going to be the linchpin if you're looking at changes in nutrition, information and change in behavior. As I mentioned earlier also is that uh, change in knowledge may not transact or change into change in um, I think activities and behavior. So any intervention for Food and nutrition for school children is something which has to be sustained. And this sustainability, which we are looking at through our program, is not just through weekly sessions with teachers, but also from morning assemblies, which will target nutrition as an important uh, topic. Uh, and during the PTM, the parent teacher meetings, and through involvement of the school management committees also, so that this nutrition topic is across board, not just in school sessions, but also during these meetings. And another intervention which we have is the Adolescent Health and Wellness Days. These are quarterly activities which take part in communities as well as schools. So nutrition is one of the main topic which is covered during the Adolescent Health and Wellness Days. And for the last point, I would like to say, even in our school health and wellness program, we have 11 themes. But out of these 11 themes, six themes are related directly to health. And three of them are nutrition, uh, healthy lifestyle, growing up. So I think uh, as a government, we have put enough stress on the importance of providing correct information on nutrition and through schools, then through our information, through our programs of providing IFA and deworming for in-school children, and through our other interventions from other ministries, well, not just uh, health and education, who are working for nutrition of school children. And I'm happy to add if you want me to add. Yeah, I think we'll come back to you with more questions and yeah. suggestions, and also uh, perhaps we'll uh, also see how we can collaborate further. Uh, I think I'll request uh, Nida to introduce all the three more panelists at one go so that we can have uh, a good round of discussion without interruptions. Okay, sir. Our second panelist is Dr. Santwana Adhikari, a senior program manager, CINI, Child in Need Institute. 
Dr. Adhikari has over 15 years of experience in looking after the Adolescent Resource Center, and she manages different programs on sexual and reproductive health, nutrition, gender, and adolescent empowerment. She is a national level trainer for the School Health and Wellness Program and Rashtriya Kishore Swastya Karyakram, and is a member of the state mentor group for the School Health and Wellness Program. I request you, ma'am, to speak on NGO perspective on priorities in nutrition education for school age children. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I want to share my screen. Okay. Yes, please. Is it visible? Yeah, it is. Yeah. Okay. So good afternoon, everybody. It is my great privilege to be a part of this e-dialogue. I'm starting with a journey of CINI. Uh, so CINI is an Indian NGO that has adopted a human right-based approach to programming with children and adolescents to foster their human and social development. Uh, CINI was founded in 1974 in West Bengal, Kolkata by Dr. Sami Chaudhary, a renowned pediatrician along with multidisciplinary team of the professionals. It started its journey from villages around Kolkata as a clinic for malnourished under five children. During its early years, a nutrition rehabilitation center was conceptualized and established to prevent and treat childhood malnutrition. Over five decades in its practice of work uh, with poor communities, CINI has thoroughly applied the principle that essential healthcare and services must be accessible to all in an acceptable and affordable way. With the full involvement of service users, we are working in five uh, states like uh, West Bengal, Jharkhand, Orissa, Assam, Tripura, and we will start our new initiative in MP soon. CINI is working, uh, uh, I mean, uh, in five thematic areas, but before that, I would like to mention about our uh, vision. So our vision is to create a friendly and responsive community where children and adolescents achieve their full potential. And our mission is to ensure that children and adolescents achieve their rights to health, nutrition, education, and protection, and participation by making duty bearers and communities responsive to their well-being. So we are working on five thematic areas like education, protection, health, and nutrition. And we are at the center point, I mean the adolescent empowerment, and we are linked with other thematic areas. And uh, I mean, I, I want to say that adolescent is in a, a horizon position, horizontal position in these thematic areas. So our uh, strategies to implement the nutrition education for children and uh, adolescents. Uh, so uh, CINI has taken different strategies regarding nutrition education for children and adolescents. We are working at the community and skin le uh, school level to enhance the knowledge of the adolescents and children on nutrition education. Uh, we also are working on the diabetes prevention uh, uh, in 580 schools of West Bengal and with 2 lakh students uh, of 6th and 7th standards supported by Arogo World. And we also try to build the capacities of the school teachers uh, known as school health and wellness ambassadors on nutrition aspects and also the uh, health practices of the uh, life. So CINI has developed school-based safe spaces known as Adolescent Resource Hub for adolescents to disseminate uh, information on nutrition education through training, regular stations, uh, through different IC materials or VCC materials. And also we have developed a lot of IC and VCC materials in an innovative way so that they can, I mean, our adolescents or the uh, peer leaders or the educators can adapt it easily and they can also disseminate the same manage to their uh, uh, adolescent group members. The another important strategy is to strengthen multi-sectoral convergence platforms and to address the importance of nutrition education among children and adolescents. CINI, a state technical partner of the 
uh, West Bengal uh, National Health Missions for the program of WIPs uh, try to ensure the compliance of the reporting mechanism. Through convergence with different government departments, CINI provided training on nutritional needs for children and adolescents to nodal teachers, medical officers, counselors, and the service providers on nutritional health for adolescents, factors affecting nutrition other than food and lifestyle diseases and risk factors. So uh, through this intervention and implementation process, first of all, I want to add one thing that in this year, the Higher Secondary Board of West Bengal uh, examination uh, of the nutrition paper, there is a a uh, question related to NGO's role in nutrition uh, chapter, and CINI is one of them. So that is our uh, kind of achievement in the education system that we got the recognition from the education department for our intervention or the in implementation. And uh, obviously, it is our, uh, I mean, responsibility to build the capacities of the service providers and the uh, stakeholders so through different sensitization program, we try to increase the accountability of the service providers towards adolescent nutrition education so that they can identify and address these issues in their areas. Uh, now we have reached to 7,22,807 uh, adolescents through our community level and school level interventions. We train peer educators and pushtidut, uh, known as nutrition ambassadors, as change agents to promote healthy behavior among children and adolescents. Near about 700 to 800 adolescent safe space or adolescent resource have, have been developed in West Bengal and in other states of uh, India. Uh, CINI has been selected as national training partner under RKSK and school health and wellness program under Ayushman Bharat. Through our program implementation, we are being able to increase adolescent participation in different convergence platforms such as uh, World Level Child Protection Committee or Village Level Child Protection Committee for advocacy their issues and also try to incorporate nutrition uh, related components in the GPDP plan. We know as uh, this GPDP, I mean Gram Panchayat Development Plan, such as promoting kitchen or a nutrition garden in their areas. CINI is working on strengthening WIPS program in West Bengal and during this program uh, implementation, IFA compliance have increased from 22 to 49% in West Bengal since 2018 to 23. We have developed training module, different training modules uh, in the form of pictorial learning conversation. We have developed different types of IC and BCC materials to uh, connect with our children, to disseminate the different information related to uh, nutrition, uh, healthy behavior, uh, physical activities, uh, about uh, diabetes prevention, et cetera. So- uh, Dr. Sandwin, I think we'll come back to you with uh, more questions on what were the problems in implementing these things um, at a later stage. We will mm -hmm. just move to our next panelist uh, uh, in the interest of time, please. Okay. okay. We'll just uh, request you to stay back with us. We'll ask you uh, more questions in terms of your implementation so that we have some learnings to take forward. Okay. Thank, thank you. you so much. Yeah. Nida, can you introduce both the uh, yeah. panelists at one go? Yes, sir. I will do that. Now, the third panelist is Dr. Skan Bali, head of school, Adani International School, Ahmedabad. Dr. Bali has been involved in education since year 2000. He has been associated with premier institutes of the country, like the Hyderabad Public School Begumpet, GD Goenka World School Gurugram, Dune School Dehradun, and Army Public School Dakshai. Dr. Bali is a recipient of various recognitions and awards, like the Progressive Principal Award, Iconic Principal Changing the World Award, Ideal Principal Award, and many more to his credit. He is also an accomplished writer and has authored several textbooks. He would be talking on school's perspective on priorities in nutrition education for school aged children. Our last panelist is the adolescent youth leader, a versatile person, a student of uh, 12th class and from Hyderabad Public School, Begumpet. Aman currently serves as a district interact representative for the Rotary District 3150. 
and has also served as the president of the Young Orators Club. He is an ardent orator and debater and has taken part in debates at national and international level. He is a sailor and a cyclist, and he seeks to understand the impact of nutrition and culture on health and wellness and persistently tries to improve his own routine. He would be talking on the youth perspective on priorities in nutrition education for school age children. Yeah, Dr. Bali, uh, from your experience, can we just uh, know about any initiative that you've taken at different schools that you've worked in and what well, are the uh, various nutrition and lifestyle skills that the children essentially need according to apart from what is taught in the curriculum? Well, good afternoon. Um, it was indeed an honor listening to every other panelist and the members. Um, really an enlightening session. And I think this is something which is very important in today's time and age. When we were growing up uh, and we were in school, we didn't have so much of junk food, so much of non-nutrition. Everything we ate at home or at school or outside was, was relatively nutritious. Our parents, grandparents were very well aware as to what to give children during summers, winters, et cetera, et cetera. I think that is changing over time. If you see that today's time and age, even parents encourage non-nutritious food um, to their children. Um, you could think of probably providing them chips. You could think of probably providing them Maggie. You could think of probably not looking at the basic nitty gritties of the nutrition. So the role of a school becomes very critical here. So what we have been doing over time uh, and uh, with all, all my colleagues in different organizations is that we always have a nutritious nutritionist on the board uh, in the school. We did that in Hyderabad as well. And we have a nutritionist on board here in Ahmedabad as well. So the nutritionist help us in um, preparing and planning our balanced diet menu for our students um, so that what they take in school is healthy um, in all aspects. Um, secondly, we also involve the nutritionist to take certain sessions with the parents uh, where parent education, parent information is equally very important. Their awareness is equally important. Our nutritionists also take sessions with the students in terms of student awareness, uh, take sessions with the staff who is involved in the dining in the kitchen who are cooking and delivering on the ground. Um, and there are certain uh, events which are organized in the school wherein students are involved about discussions on nutrition, about discussion on healthy food. Um, we make sure with the help of the nutritionist um, all the time that uh, different kinds of colors are visible in the food items. What kind of floor is used is, is, um, uh, is, is also um, equally healthy for children, less oil, less spices, yet making it tasty for children. So all these are the different parameters which schools do, but I think it's very important for every school, one, to have a nutritionist on board, um, number two, to have a healthy dialogue with the parents, students, nutritionists, and the school put together and create that kind of an awareness amongst children because that is something very, very important in today's time and age. Okay, thank you so much. And that's a perspective uh, to you know take care of the child's food environment, both, both at school as well as at uh, home. Uh, yes. Now, I think uh, the most important perspective of uh, today's e-dialogue is from the adolescent uh, uh, participant, because that's very important and their views are very important to be brought on the table. And uh, to ask Aman, I know a uh, lot has been said about nutrition, and then uh, we will uh, also ask you if schools are really your uh, best bet for getting nutrition information, or what are your best sources for getting nutrition information uh, most reliable? Give us a perspective of not just yours, but also of your peers that you re regularly interact with. Um, can I make the presentation I prepared? Um, or are we? Oh, oh yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and then uh, we'll, I mean, I hope it will uh, be in time for us to conclude. Yeah. yeah I'll, I'll right. Okay. Sure. Um, I hope everybody can see my screen. Yes, yes, yeah. please. Okay. I put it in slideshow. Yeah. So um, before I begin, uh, I thank ICMR, NIN, and all their supporters and partners for this opportunity. And I personally thank Dr. Uh, Dr. Subarao and Dr. Uh, Nida Hazari 
I don't think it's so often that a 16 year old gets to speak at an event organized by the ICMR. And I think it also says a lot about the organizers, organizers and how incredible it is um, that they've found a space uh, for someone my age to speak at a conference of this kind. Um, I'm very humbled uh, after listening to everyone who just spoke. I cannot offer expertise like they just did. Uh, but what I can is offer what I have learned uh, through experience, observation, and my own uh, study. Uh, we've, we've heard the phrase often, we are what we eat. Um, indeed, the food we eat quite literally becomes us. It's not just our body's fuel. Uh, it, it doesn't just give us energy. It can affect our moods too. There are studies that have found uh, correlation between spicy foods and aggression, for example. And I think it plays not only a very important role in our physical health, but also our mental health. And it also becomes a very important component of our identity. Uh, it becomes an important component uh, of our identity through our culture, through your personal heritage, uh, through the climate of the region you live in. Um, if you're a non-vegetarian or you're a vegan or you're allergic to certain food, that adds to your unique personality. And I think that's that's uh, one thing I thought of, uh, and I think a lot of my peers think of when they think of food. It, it does become an interesting and, and an important component of their identity too. We live in an age of the internet and um, influencers. And I think Dr. Subara was uh, hinting at this when he was introducing me. Um, absolutely, I do not um, rely uh, as such uh, on, on nutrition uh, education uh, given by any sort of official institution or anything of that sort. It, I get my nutrition education mostly from, from the internet. I avoid the influences, but it gets a little difficult at times to do that. And I think the internet and the influences on social media fill the void created by a rather lack of nutrition education at a majority of uh, schools in India. And uh, the end goal of in the internet and influences is not necessarily to promote a healthy living. It could be to build strength and, uh, and muscle, uh, to grow slimmer or to become more attractive none of which contribute to a person's health as such. Uh, and more important, uh, more importance is given to ensuring that the content is popular or over importance being given to it being suitable for at least a majority of the audience who are at the receiving end of, uh, of such content. And in order to gain that popularity, social media and, and its influences have, have to be selective in their component, which means that they will omit a lot of information that may be relevant and important to such kind of diets uh, or, to, or, or to the routines that they themselves follow, which, win, which may not uh, affect uh, their audiences as, they, as it has uh, for themselves. And I think lastly, a lot of these diet routines that are formulated or followed by certain influencers cannot work for everyone. And this is something a lot of users of the internet and of social media forget when they are consuming uh, such content. Um, we also live in an age of information overload and misinformation. So th there are two uh, big factors uh, contributing uh, to bad information on, on social media. Number one, that there's too much information available and it's very difficult, especially uh, for an adolescent uh, to make choice between which information is reliable or which information is not, uh, which information is more credible and which is not, um, and how to and how they can tackle misinformation and and these experiential um, diets that are formulated by some people that that may not necessarily be uh, uh, medical as such. Um, but however, there is a lot I think. Schools and, and uh, academicians can uh, sort of understand from the way in which the internet and, and influencers have done so well at uh, gaining the attention of uh, adolescents when it comes to nutrition education. And that has been because of the mode and the style of 
content delivery, the language features, um, of course, an attractive individual uh, presenting it uh, uh, very often, uh, though, though we can't do much about that in schools. Um, I mean, again, notions of who's attractive and who's not as enforced by social media. So that's another very negative side of it. And uh, appearing connected to the audience. Um, and I think this is what we can sort of integrate perhaps into uh, school curriculums. Uh, and I mean here the mode and content, uh, the style of uh, content delivery, contextualizing it and making it relevant to adolescents when we are trying to uh, sort of integrate nutrition education into uh, the classroom. A um, couple of things I've thought of uh, when I think of how nutrition education can be more relevant to the classrooms of my peers, my own classroom, for, uh, for, for, uh, for the matter. Uh, I think firstly, it's important to start teaching the why. Uh, why shouldn't an adolescent eat too much fast foods? I mean, we are, we are very often told that you shouldn't consume too much of fast food, that you shouldn't uh, uh, have uh, too much of, uh, of Coca-Cola and, uh, and whatnot. But why, why shouldn't we? And I absolutely agree that we shouldn't. But a more reasoned-based approach to explaining this would be more helpful. Uh, what happens, uh, another example, when carbohydrates enter the body? And here I'm referring to the process of breaking down of sugars uh, and how this can actually help understand why too much of carbs or too less of it can be harmful when we actually understand the process of how carbohydrates are digested uh, by the body and how the process and consequences differ from simple carbs to complex carbs um, and which, which foods are actually simple and complex carbs. Uh, a lot of us are not aware of this. I myself don't uh, have, I don't know if I'm consuming a simple carb or a complex carb uh, when, I'm, when I'm eating food. And how this entire process of digestion is very different from proteins. And how, because of that, the effect proteins have and the function they have in your body can be very different. I think these questions should be sort of laid emphasis on uh, when we are uh, imparting nutrition education in a classroom. I think the second point is that we should sort of understand um, that healthy eating is a part of a much larger healthy lifestyle. So rather than selling uh, to adolescents just healthy eating, we should also try and integrate that into a much larger curriculum of a healthy lifestyle. And this also includes um, more sensitivity towards mental health, more sensitivity towards uh, the way in which adolescents today interact uh, with different people on social media, more sensitivity towards uh, issues such as body shaming, issues such as uh, body perceptions that, that adolescents develop at this age and which is exacerbated by social media and the internet. Um, more sensitivity towards notions of who looks good and who doesn't and what kind of diet you need to have to look that way. And, and all, all, all of that has to be tackled and the best place to tackle it and the most effective place to tackle it is in the classroom. And I, I do not see where else, other than a person's home, of course, these issues can be tackled. Um, thirdly, connecting eating to the environment. Um, as an adolescent myself, I'm very passionate about the environment. Um, and I share that sentiment with a lot of my peers. Uh, according to the United Nations, Food needs to be grown, processed, transported, distributed, prepared, consumed, and sometimes disposed of. And all of this contributes in one way or the other to greenhouse gases, uh, which in turn trap the sun's heat and uh, lead to climate change. And about a third of all human-caused greenhouse gas emissions is linked to food, according to the UN. Um, if this were to be discussed, uh, deliberated upon in classrooms, it can do a lot to uh, push students towards thinking of how they can actually help the environment uh, by shifting to local consumption. Avocados, for example, are a very healthy source of nutrition, but the amount of emissions and the uh, way in which uh, they contribute to climate change must also be understood. Uh, so this then leads to how we can 
integrate uh, regional and cultural foods into a child's diet, uh, which also are helpful to, uh, to uh, mitigating climate change. I think, uh, fourthly, freeing choices from consumerism. Consumerism is, I, I uh, define consumerism as a system or a socio-economic system that encourages the acquisition of goods and services in an ever increasing uh, amount. Um, and what this does is uh, creates an environment where you have to eat fast foods because everybody is eating fast foods. You have to eat fast foods because they have the best marketing among all kinds of foods that there is out there. And I think uh, Dr. Monica Arora also referred to this and how she found uh, things about marketing in her own uh, research. And we need to, I think, teach um, ourselves and we need teachers to teach us how we can free our choices from the bounds of, of consumerism and how we can be more independent in making those choices. And lastly, um, and perhaps the most important point is rather than um, making huge changes in, in or forcing changes uh, in what a person, what an adolescent can or cannot consume, the emphasis should shift towards equipping students, empowering them to take charge and make their own choices uh, when it comes to their food. Um, it, this is very important. Again, something uh, studies have found of how effective this can be uh, in, uh, in the short term and uh, the long term. Uh, lastly, uh, the nutrition skills, I have personally benefited a lot from uh, trying to shift to a healthier lifestyle. Uh, number one is to the, understand the right nutrients and uh, where to find them. Uh, if I'm going to uh, have an exercising session in an hour or I'm, I'm going to work out in an hour, um, because it's so close to the time in which I will be uh, engaging in an activity of physical exertion, uh, what I have learned, and, and the experts can correct me here, that I should um, have a diet of or a short meal, a small meal of low fiber uh, food, which digest very, which is digested very easily by the body and can help me uh, while I'm uh, engaging in that physical activity. So understanding um, your own activities in a day and what nutrients you need to best uh, fulfill those activities, uh, which nutrients have what qualities and why, and how you can um, integrate those nutrients if, if there's a need into your diet. Um, what I've found is that uh, Indian food actually provides for a lot of the nutrients that uh, we look for in our diets. Uh, there is significant balance when it comes to Indian cuisines in, uh, in terms of carbs and, and proteins. And there are, there are numerous dishes uh, and, and Indian cuisine is rich in this kind uh, of in, in a diverse kind of diet. So there's lots to choose from within our own uh, cuisine. Uh, second, I think uh, there is no shame in trying to sort of uh, plan your uh, um, food routine, uh, to sort of think about it a little, uh, reflect on what you're eating, why you're eating, how can you change that, and how you can adjust what you eat, how much you eat, or increase uh, your consumption uh, based on your activities. So. Uh, uh, adolescents should be encouraged to plan their uh, their plate. Um, uh, learn to cook. Uh, this is something I found most helpful. It's a skill that I uh, personally uh, enjoy. Um, I've cooked for a very long time. And this gives you absolute control over what you're going to eat. It also adds a special kind of connection to what you eat because when you cook your food yourself or when you learn to cook, you begin to appreciate food uh, for what it is. And that is, is absolutely remarkable. And at the end of the day, it's a life skill uh, that, that can always be helpful. Uh, you don't have to be trapped on a desert island to uh, depend on cooking. It's something that, that will be helpful throughout life. Lastly, discipline like a pro. 
uh, here I refer to self-discipline. It's uh, about teaching consistency, teaching persistence, um, teaching how you can take control of your own diet and how you can take, you should take control uh, of how you interact with food every day and how you can make that healthier by the day. Thank you so much. Thank you for your excellent ideas. I think uh, they echo very well with uh, one of our previous e-dialogue uh, adolescent youth leaders who also said similar things, but they said, you know, uh, they know and understand and get a lot of information about nutrition, but they uh, do not in, they do not get to apply it in their day-to-day uh, -day food choices because of various factors uh, like you know peer pressure, the body image, and then understanding and things like that. I think uh, you've put them in a different perspective that they should be part of uh, the curriculum and nutrition literacy most importantly. And we are already running short of time, and then we are 20 minutes beyond schedule. Uh, but I'll, uh, I'll, I still have one or two quick questions to ask our panelists, especially Dr. Zoya, for all the time that she spared today. Uh, do we have any lessons from other health-related programs that we can scale up for uh, nutrition education at this level? Since uh, your ministry is interacting with the education ministry to make health a priority in the schools, uh, can... Um, uh, is there any way that nutrition, lifestyle, stress, and all these, again, are coming broadly into the spectrum of uh, uh, health when other aspects are also dealt with? Uh, is there Are there any quick lessons that we can learn from, say, any of the particular health programs that can be applied to nutrition, literacy, and skill building? Okay. Uh, that is a very vast question, which you asked, Dr. Uh, Subhanao. But briefly, I will say, like, I think what Monica mentioned is that you have a good example with the tobacco control program that seems to have worked well with the schools and has good ownership with the Ministry of Education and from the school department. So that is something which is good. But besides that, I would also say that so many other parallel programs are running for health and wellness of school programs, school, uh, school children. One of them, of course, is also the RBS, you know, Rashtri Bal Swasti Kapkan, which is looking at screening of children once a year. Then we also have Anemia Mukh Bharat, which uh, I think Preetu is here. She's uh, very well aware. Provision of IFA tablets, deworming is there. But we also have the National Mental Health Program, which because I think what Aman also mentioned is the, the lot of mental health issues. In fact, we cannot just take nutrition as one silos intervention for silos. school health children. There has to be a lot of other linkages with other existing programs which are there, plus looking at innovation and innovating and also tweaking our programs because, you know, India is, is, is made of so many uh, states are united. Uh, we cannot have something like one glove fits all, you know, what works in Tamil Nadu may not work in Bihar or not work in JNK and same goes for maybe Assam and Gujarat. So that freedom is given to all the states to innovate and to tweak the programs and to support interventions, which is more pertinent to their own school children. So if I just quick, quick example, some states which are struggling more with malnutrition, more with anemia, they have interventions in school health program to have more sessions based on awareness of how to keep themselves healthy, what is healthy lifestyle, what is locally nutritious food which is available to them, that how to innovate in that also. And similarly, other pro other states which are struggling with more of obesity, higher nutrition, the other side of malnutrition, they also have interventions of maybe adding of how to look at Fit India movement involving the interventions of Fit India with the school intervention. So there are a lot of, I think uh, the flex, the beauty of Indian, uh, the whole scenario is that there's a huge variation across states and whatever guidelines and policies which are made at the national level have the, I think, beauty of flexibility across states. So states are innovating on their own. And just, uh, um, I would say as an example, you have like school-based intervention, say some, some school, some they have managed to train all their teachers at one go because that is the importance they stressed on training teachers on health and wellness, while other states are gradually doing it slowly, slowly expanding from one state to five states to 10 states. So that I would say that the interventions which are school based need to be expanded to all states. And as of now, you may be aware that we are already implementing school health and wellness in 296 districts across India, and we have trained almost three lakh teachers. So that ownership has, and I'm uh, happy to share that every year this ownership from state is increasing. So in the next two years, we hope to go across all the districts.
topics, but uh, but um, only caveat is that we as of now we are implementing in government and government aided schools. But on the side, CBSC has gone ahead and trained the school principals and also the training two teachers for school across twenty seven thousand schools. So that ownership has come from another part of education, which is CBSC. So I think this licensing, this partnership is is so dynamic that all the time I think every month we have a new partnership coming. Somebody else wants to go into maybe tribal schools, so we have also have a partnership with the tribal affairs. So it's I would say if the awareness, in fact. If you have evidence, because if you have evidence, then you have some kind of policy. And when we make a policy, then we make a program. So I'm, I'm happy to see that so many people are working on generating evidence on importance of correct nutrition school children. So better is the evidence, the more leverage we as policymakers have in influencing programs. So I, I will stop there, and I will see what other inputs are needed. Thank you, thank you, uh, Dr. Bali. I have one quick question for you, as somebody who's been uh, handling the. School scenario. I I hope Dr. Bali is there. Sir, he left the meeting. Yeah, as he had a meeting. Had to... Okay. Yes. I'm so sorry. Yeah. And then I just wanted to ask him if the teachers are burdened. Yeah, I'll go to Dr. Uh, Sadhana once to just find out. Uh, I think West Bengal is the only uh, uh, state which has a special paper for nutrition at school level, if I'm not wrong, uh, as a special subject. Uh, yes. I, I think uh, in other states it isn't there. Uh, that could be one uh, step forward for us if we can uh, think. And there are several schools where, you know, I, I, I don't know, when we were in school or in uh, junior college, we had these special papers on Indian heritage and culture, which would not count for in your uh, overall grading, but uh, passing this or having minimum skills in them was mandatory. Can we think of something like that for nutrition, where nutrition is an important subject that everybody has to get through with some some skill at the school level and then uh, only your uh, rest of the scores will be uh, graded for uh, your ranking or uh, you know uh, establishing your uh, uh, overall ranking in the school curriculum what has been your experience with west bengal uh, you you're trying to integrate your curriculum with uh, the existing iec in the schools can you quickly tell us in 2 minutes yes uh, that uh, i have already uh, shared that we are working with the schools and uh, 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 we selected two nodal teachers before school health and wellness program. We have started this initiative in the school to, uh, in, I mean, increase the knowledge about nutritional aspects. And it is important to build the capacities of the teachers and uh, uh, sensitize them, motivate them about these issues. And they can disseminate this same, uh, I mean, knowledge to their students. So that is very important and engaging headmasters or the principals of the school is also very important because they are the main, uh, so I mean the think tank, they can also uh, promote something in their schools. So we got this opportunity to work with them and to incorporate some nutritional, uh, I mean, uh, related chapters uh, in their uh, curricular, uh, curriculum activi curricular, uh, curricular activities. And uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, in West Bengal, we are able to start some uh, taste on nutritional chapter. So that is some kind of uh, achievement of our side. And we want to uh, expand this initiative in other state also to incorporate this uh, nutritional education in other schools of the other states like Jharkhand, Assam, Odisha. Okay. So that Thank is you. our Thank you. Yes, Dr. Zoya. So sorry to just interrupt, but uh, I remember in all our state interactions, when we talk to young people, they always say that it is very hard to resist uh, these fast food. I think Aman also has mentioned. So we must give it to them that it is okay to have fast food once in a while. You, if yes, you say yes. no, no, it doesn't reach anywhere and the children just switch off. You know, they're saying, okay, this person doesn't want me to have burger ever, then there's no point, you know. So we have to accept the fact that I think even we as adults, sometimes we do want to have this junk food, which is fine, yes. you know. So sometimes it's allowed, but then on the whole, so the dialogue should not be never have junk food. You yes. can have sometimes, but on the whole, you should try and have, you know, A, B, C, D. So those options should always be given rather than saying, no, you should give them options of what are the alternatives when you feel like having this something which you can have, which is low in calories and nutritious. Just, just putting it there. That's it. Yes, I can see the question related to teachers getting more burdened and innovative models as, as more and more we think of them. Dr. Monica is raising this question. Yes, that's true. And then taking forward your point, uh, Dr. Zoya, I think uh, way back in 2016 or so when 
Dr. Lakshmaya in the uh, we have done a study on uh, uh, you know combating adolescent uh, obesity. One of the things that we've done is the uh, one day in the school would be a junk food day. We would allow, while the schools would monitor the other days, one day is a cheat day that is allowed and then that really worked. It's, it's not completely saying no, because they'll switch off uh, from us if we start saying uh, no junk food and you know what they like to eat if we ask them not to eat. Dr. Monica, do you have any last remarks to make and then we'll quickly go to the closing uh, part of the uh, program. Thank you, sir. Uh, just that, yes, uh, what Dr. Zoya said is uh, very practical. And this is what when we do school, food segregation, we call foods as sometimes food and daily foods. Yeah. And uh, that is where uh, they understand that uh, these are foods they can consume sometimes only. But also important is for them to maintain a food diary because when you start writing, that is where you start realizing, oh, I took a samosa today as an extra one. And yesterday I took a dosa and day before I took French fries. So not realizing that even if you're taking one, it is happening almost every day. So that maintaining a record and monitoring their own food sometimes is very helpful. Thank you. Yeah, I think uh, we have had an extraordinary session. And then the, uh, I think uh, the biggest takeaways we've had from the adolescent speaker, uh, who has in a way summarized what we have uh, done through our research and uh, other things, uh, uh, you know, uh, from around the world. And I thank uh, the speakers who've been here. And as usual, I'll go with the five takeaways that I have got from this particular uh, thing. And these are going to be the summary just, outlines. Yes, please. Just I want to add one more thing that we have to promote the locally available uh, foods and the vegetables. It is very important True. to, uh, I mean, sensitize about these uh, locally available foods and the, uh, I mean, uh, vegetables. True. To the I, I think uh, I, I was coming to that as an important uh, takeaway. And uh, from uh, what we understand from the Lebanese perspective or from uh, the Arab world is that they have done some exercise to understand nutrition literacy and what are the drivers or what are the factors that influence nutrition literacy in adolescents. Nutrition literacy is clearly operationally defined when they did the study and it's beyond mere nutrition knowledge delivery. So that's one thing that is an uh, important thing that we need to do at uh, in the Indian scenario. The second and most important is from the Malaysian experience. Understand that uh, nutrition of curriculum is very important. And if it is adolescent driven, adolescents are partners in it, along with the school teachers, it can go a long way. And, uh, but, uh, also, I mean, Dr. Monica's presentation alluded to that in terms of tobacco and uh, uh, sugary foods and things like that. But nevertheless, uh, scaling up such interventions is always has always been an issue. And there are uh, several demonstrations of uh, great work that can happen when there is some support from uh, an agency and whether it will continue post that or not is a very important thing. But many such activities should go on uh, parallelly to make sure that nutrition knowledge turns into nutrition literacy and a useful skill uh, for the adolescents. And we, we are very clear and uh, evidence is very clear that the content in the school textbooks about nutrition, food safety, and other associated uh, subjects is very, very little. And Dr. Radhika's presentation has brought it out. And then uh, in the new education policy, I think, as I said, I'll put forth that point that if we have access and if we can impress upon the education ministry <clears throat> that nutrition is a skill-based thing and it's very important. And the key skills that the children should have are being able to distinguish between what is healthy and what is unhealthy, whether it is at home or outside, and being able to choose wisely from what is available locally is most important. And third and most important is in the context of, uh, you know, many prepackaged foods that are available today, being able to read the labels and make uh, an informed choice of foods. If these three skills are incorporated as necessary skills for children to get through uh, for their rest of the academic career to be assessed, uh, then definitely this will be taken up seriously by all schools and all parents and all children. 
and uh, uh, fourth important point is that there is a, a, a there is a concurrence between what our director said in the beginning and what man has said towards the end uh, that there is a void created in the schools of course schools are a great entry point uh, for education and it can happen only in schools that nutrition literacy can take place but this nutrition literacy and excessive dependence on social media and digital technologies may not be very helpful schools as an entry point is yes but they should be skill based education and their environment body uh, uh, image perception and also most importantly uh, how to make healthy foods trendy as trendy as the uh, other foods is one thing that we need to look at and their nutrition literacy needs to concentrate and uh, last but not the least uh, i think nutrition literacy uh, efforts should go on with all the colleagues uh, who are doing this work as uh, dr zoya has rightly said there is so much of information that's uh, uh, you know available so many experiments that are available but what is that we can uh, take forward before our uh, i think this is quite a lot of thought a uh, food for thought before our thought for food uh, precedes our uh, thoughts i think we should call it a day and i thank you all for being such nice speakers and uh, uh, elucidating your uh, ideas and experiences uh, very well i thank one and all and i'll be failing in my duties if i don't thank unicef my partners in the consortium phfi uh, ifpri deakin uh, uh, ghai and then uh, resolve to solve and all others and most importantly niti aayog and ministry of health and family welfare and uh, thank you very much uh, for being uh, audience being a patient audience for a two and a half hour long session uh, and i'm sure there are a lot of uh, great takeaways from this session thank you very much thanks everyone stay safe jai hind thank you thank you so thank you everyone and 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 last but not the least i want to thank three of my colleagues who have done all this i was not well in the last two three days and they are the ones who handled it there were little technical glitches in terms of Uh, being able to log in on the zoom platform without a passcode but we have had uh, exciting number of people watching it live on youtube and thank you all thank you very much thank you thank you thank you